You know, my Christian colleagues have a tradition, at least some of them do, uh, prior to giving or delivering a sermon, they say a particular prayer, petitioning God that they as preachers be given strength and that somehow they would speak what <clears throat> they believe to be the truth as they understand it. We don't have that tradition, but if we did, I would be saying such a prayer right now. For the fact is, these high holidays test our mettle. Their traditional essence demands an excruciating and potentially brutal process of self-appraisal and evaluation with full honesty and no space for excuses. The tradition calls us Heshbon HaNefesh, soul-searching, and gives us the entire month of Elul, which leads up to this night of Rosh Hashanah, to fully take our own measure, to be genuine in our assessment, and to alter our conduct. Admittedly, taking account has been a uniquely melancholy experience for me this year. I'm not sure I know all the reasons. In some measure, I presume it is linked to this being my last high holidays with you as senior rabbi. Coming to the finish line after half a century of congregational service is sweet and exciting and unsettling. I suppose it will be naturally disquieting for me to step aside from what has been my life work as a congregational rabbi for half a century. But it has also been my passion, and that makes it even more difficult to step aside. My sons are also here this evening, my older one a New Yorker, my younger one from California, and he has brought our firstborn grandson, about whom many of you know since I had the chutzpah to announce his birth from the pulpit on Yom Kippur four years ago. It's been at least that long, we calculated probably more like eight years since we have been together for these holidays. Though my grandson Gabe has watched his grandfather by way of live streaming, tomorrow will be the very first time that he and I will be able to sit in the children's service together. And so I am fully aware of the passage of time and think about legacy, both standing in front of my sons as their father and in front of you as your rabbi. And probably for many of you, the passage of time and legacy is on your minds as well. So this Rosh Hashanah is different for me, and it is different for you in other ways. So tonight, knowing all that has happened. Let's step outside ourselves and take a look at ourselves. Let us ask, are we truth tellers? In Judaism, we have a tradition of writing ethical wills, Prompted by a deep desire to bequeath our aspirations to our descendants, we want our children and grandchildren and all that follow to know the ideals and ethical guidelines by which we yearn to have them live. These ethical wills are personal reflections refracted through the prism of a parent's life. Now, ethical wills can be a glorious conveyance from generation to generation, but I know that they incorporate a fair amount of prevarication, a level of parental arrogance. They do not tell the entire story. I have not read a single published ethical will which includes a parent's admission of their own wrongdoing their own failures or faults or weaknesses or even ways in which they may have acted abhorrently. We parents are typically completely comfortable and expert in telling our children what to do without narrating for them even a measure of our own imperfections and struggles without agonizing over the ways in which we felt and had been inept as children or as teenagers when we were their age, or even into our adult lives. 
We find it so difficult to share the disturbing sides of our lives, whether our, with friends or our children or perhaps especially our spouses. Instead, we choose to wear the masks of strength and control and unerring achievement. We want to appear perfect. Parental arrogance which touts our own laudatory image and builds impervious fences against awarenesses of our weakness and our struggles and mistakes is inherently unfair and unhelpful for our children. For how can we possibly tell them of our lofty aspirations for them without recounting not necessarily in all the details but at least a bit of the way or the times we miss the marks that we are now assuming they should reach. It would do us well to be truth-tellers. And if we were to need encouragement to do this, all we have to do is take a look at the ultimate ethical will of our people, our own Tanakh, our own holy Hebrew scriptures which is, at its core, an unabashed and ongoing repetition of human fallibility. Within its core, the Bible tells stories of great people doing terrible things, engaging in abysmally improper behavior, behavior and continuously missing the high ground. Consider that upon his wife Sarah's demand, Aaron did not stand his ground in protecting Hagar, the mother of his firstborn son Ishmael. He was willing to let Ishmael die alongside of his mother, as he was soon to murder his younger, or willing to murder his youngest son Isaac on Mount Moriah, upon the perceived expectations of God. Abraham could have done much, be much better in protecting his children as he had tempted to do for the complete strangers in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham could not even be trusted to protect the sexual integrity of his beloved wife, Sarah. Twice, Abraham compromised Sarah's sexual integrity by passing her off as his sister rather than as his wife and then compelling her to be complicit in the charade to save his own skin. Abraham often exemplified weak character. It would be very difficult to have been his son or his wife or to be his friend. And our ancestor Jacob, not much better. He schemed to trick his father Isaac and to steal from his twin brother Esau that which properly belonged to Esau. In one of the first recorded episodes of egregious family dysfunction. And our great hero Moses, <laughs> he sent his wife and sons away so he could single-handedly focus on his mission leading one commentary to ask the question that some of us should ask of ourselves. As sometimes happens with leader, the question is asked, have Moses' official duties caused him to neglect his family and his capacity for familial intimacy? Now, Moses is no model of a caring family man. And the legendary King David? Affirmed as the progenitor of the Messiah to come, you know the story, out of lust for Bathsheba and in order to have her for himself, he arranged for the killing of her husband and his trusted friend and general Uriah, so that he could take Bathsheba for himself, the very Bathsheba with whom he had already committed adultery before Uriah's death. Our Tanakh is filled with these stories, some of which are too tawdry to even have, that we would have the stomach to teach our religious school children. These stories are about human frailty and moral depravity, but they are also about us. Other religious traditions may have great stories of saints. We have no saints. Just people like you and me struggling to survive, aspiring to do good, and often behaving badly. 
We know that great people tarnish their ethical records with abysmally bad behavior and episodic mistakes for which they may eventually be ashamed, but they can never undo. We need to be truth-tellers, at least to ourselves. If not, we will never change our ways. Every year, we, your clergy, take our confirmation class away on a retreat. Many of these 10th graders have known each other since they were in nursery school together. But we give them the opportunity on Friday night as part of Sabbath services and the safety of confidentiality to reveal their masks, the ways in which they believe that they have behaved that is out of sync with the way they know themselves to be. But you see, we all wear masks. We wear the mask to hide our self-perceived faults and weakness. We wear the mask of certainty when we're shaking, the mask of gregariousness when we may be shy, the mask of humor when we're hurting terribly, the mask of a victim when we're not a victim. We wear masks with friends and classmates and business associations and even spouses concerned that for them to know the truth about us would be for them to think less of us. Now, not all masks are destructive or wrong, and some of them may be essential and help us to get through life, but to be unaware of these masks is both dishonest and treacherous. The 19th century Swedish, Swedish theologian Soren Kierkegaard says, there comes the midnight hour when all people must unmask. Tonight is the midnight hour. The time that we need to take account and to confess what we know about ourselves, at least to ourselves, and hopefully even to those about whom we care the most. We who are not perfect or blameless or faultless will love our children always, and when they fall short of the, our aspirations for them, I would pray we love them nonetheless. Last week, a friend wrote to his circle of friends, Plan well and think about the things you wish to change about yourself and your world. Dig deep, be honest with yourself, find a confidant or, confidant or two if you're lucky and talk about it. For this is the time of year to plan your ten days of awe. Some of us may need more than ten, God knows, but ten is what we get, so let's make the most of it. Let us be truth-tellers. And let us be tender. Abraham Heschel, a pivotal Jewish thinker of the 20th century, died in 1972 at the age of 65. He was not old by today's standards, yet his amazing shock of white hair, along with his signature white beard, provided an aura of wise elderliness. Reflecting on his life, Heschel said, when I was young, I admired clever people, but now that I'm old, I admire kind people. In this meritocratic society of ours, we've been, become enamored by the measurable standards of success. We talked about it a great deal as we made our through, way through the financial downturn that struck us on Rosh Hashanah on that eve five years ago in 2008. The survival of our spirit then depended on our cheshbon and nefesh, a reappraisal, and we were compelled to affirm that our self-worth was not the equivalent of our net worth. We held on to immutable, eternal values that anchored us even as the economic waves continued to crash down on us. As Jews and as a congregation, we grasp with full might the love of our family, the strength of our community, and the power of our faith. 
along with the historical truth that walls could fall, but life would continue, that hope would triumph over desolation, and that in the end, kindness would triumph over greed. And that's what kept us alive and optimistic. John Gardner wrote, you find that the world loves talent, but it pays off on character. Good character shuns arrogance and has no place for haughtiness and no tolerance for conceit. The Torah was well aware of the inclination to arrogance, especially when we are materially successful. It is written in the book of Deuteronomy so starkly, so when you have eaten your fill and built those fine, magnificent houses of yours, and your, and your possessions have multiplied beyond your imagination, and your money has increased beyond your wildest dreams, and you have prospered in every way possible, beware, for it is at that time that you could become haughty, and you would forget that it is the Lord your God who delivered you out of the house of bondage. Unless we need our tradition even provides a checklist for indications of arrogance. It says that an arrogant person is one that ha does good deeds and gives to tzedakah only for public notice. An arrogant person is one that shuns public association with those of lesser financial me means or reputation out of concern that their own public image would be tarnished. An arrogant person is one that never believes they have done wrong, or that assumes that their success is dependent only on them alone. These are the indications of arrogance, and we have a choice to make, and it is a matter of deliberate intention, best indicated for me in a Cherokee tale and legend I most recently read in Peter Georgesco's The Constant Choice, the story goes this way. A grandfather sits his grandchildren arrayed around him in a circle and tells his grandchildren, a terrible fight is going in, on inside of me between two wolves. There's the wolf of fear and anger and arrogance and greed. And there's the wolf of kindness and humility and love and courage. And he continued, that fight that is going on inside of me is going on, my grandchildren, inside of you and inside of every human being. And there was silence. And then finally one of his grandchildren asked, but grandfather, which wolf wins? And the grandfather answered, the wolf that you feed. Georgesco's thesis is that people can align themselves with good through daily choice, and the better we know ourselves, the more capable we are to make better choices in our lives. Tenderness and humility are a choice we can make. I believe that. We don't need to be in love to be tender. Tenderness prompts us to be forgiving. It helps us to treat people decently, even if we're merely passing them on the street. Tenderness presumes the godliness of every person's being. It makes us kinder, more gentle, wistful, and wondrous, and gracious, and compassionate. Tenderness permits us to resonate with the longings and the dreams, the hurt, and the love of others. It compels us to soothe their pain, comfort their hurt, wipe their tears away, hug them in their loneliness and permit their syncopated life rhythm. And above all, tenderness permits the telling of stories, the confession of wrongdoing, and the mitigation of aloneness. Incipient tenderness and goodwill, which I long to embrace and which I continue honestly to work on myself allows me to understand at times what others are unwilling to, see, to say. You know, you know more about a person by the look on their face 
which are always telling the truth, and their words, which are often failing. A person's face tells the entire story before they even manage to utter a word. Tenderness permits us to give the benefit of doubt to our children, which they most certainly deserve, and to abandon harsh critique of which you and I all know we are so readily capable to express with our spouses. Kind and tender people make this world sing. They make my life joyful. They make everything that I would will to do lovely. And they make this congregation exquisite. I long for the continued flow of tenderness within me. And I will work for it as best I can. But above all, I ache to be forgiving more than critical and relish kindness before judgment And if it grows into love, then I'll let it be. And finally, let us be grateful. In an interview just ten days before he died, Abraham Heschel exhorted us, remember to build your life as if it was a work of art. And this brings me back to where I began with you. We take account of ourselves and our legacy. What is it that we leave in our wake? For myself, it is, I hope, that I told the truth, that I cultivated an instinct of tenderness that is born within all of us, and that I fed the wolf of good. And I would want it to be said that I was grateful for the opportunity God gave me to live the life that I am living. But let's look around us, and I mean that. Look to your right and look to your left. Take a look. Within your arm's reach, I believe, may be the children who carry your lifeblood, or the spouse who still takes your breath away. Perhaps a friend who is close enough to become your confessor and you to be his or hers. The person with whom you would choose to live your life, to share your joys and your sorrows as well. A person who just makes your life better. Let's take account and not take for granted the remarkable gifts that you and I have. Here we are in the middle of this incredible community that matters to us in this amazing hall, which though not our synagogue home, we make our home for these hours and days. And we are citizens of this extraordinary city of ours, which bustles with the delectable mix of cultures and people and races and religions in which we are free, still free to follow our dreams, get along, embrace our faith, speak our minds, and live openly as Jews without an iota of fear. And we are given the right to pursue a life worth living. Life is filled with the possibilities, with our frailties and our blessings, our victories and our failures and our disappointments and our ambitions. How can we not be grateful for the gifts that God has placed within our reach? And it is for more than health and happiness and love and family, for which I hope we would give thanks Should we not be grateful for the gifts that we assume to be of our own making? With some level of conceit, we believe that we gave root to our own intelligence, that we alone are responsible for our work ethic or our personal drive or our aspirations. We believe that the credit is ours alone because we have the ability to master information more than most and to retain information longer than most. We believe even that we are responsible for our own good character, but we are the inheritors of so much that has preceded us. These gifts have been built into our DNA. They've been formed in the culture of our families. They are built on the ethics of our people. They are dependent on being in the right place at the right time with the right idea. Much of our success is a matter of luck and chance and environment for all of which I give credit to forces beyond me that I know as God. 
And for that I'm grateful to my core. And it's along with the psalmist that I believe, Ki Chastacha Gadol Alai, you, O oh God, have been infinitely kind and gracious to me. For me, my great gifts are my family, and it is you. It is my parents who have passed from this earth and my children who are here. And it is my wife who does take my breath away. It is my faith and my people, it is my friends and my colleagues, it is my visions and aspirations and hopes and longing to be even better. And finally, I am grateful for myself. With all that has been implanted into me and for which I can take absolutely no credit. Each of us has been given the gift of ourselves, each with our opportunity to mold this creation and to make a great difference, even if it is only within the intimate cluster of our people with whom we live and work. What incredible benevolence has been shared with us and extended to us the ability to be truth-tellers, to be sensitively tender and of goodwill and humble. You see, we can build this world as we build our own lives. What a gift. So let us be grateful for it all. Yes, even including, need I say, new chapters and the right to change our ways and the intention and commitment to begin this year differently. We now have again the chance to do that. An amazing gift has been put within our reach. So God willing, you and I, each alone and all together, will make the best of that gift, with God's help. Amen.